All right, well, let's begin by reading the, the text that, that I have in the bulletin, and actually a little bit of the uh, context of it as well. Um, what I'm going to do is just try to deal with what I think are perhaps two of the most important things regarding the Sabbath uh, today. And then next week, we're going to begin actually looking at the Gospel of Luke. So we're going to leave this subject behind today. So there's a lot to say about it and very little time. So I'll, I'll just say what I think uh, I can get in during this time frame. But it's, before I read this text, let me just give you a little bit of an outline of what it's actually saying. The author to the Hebrews is using the example of the Jews that were brought out of Egypt and brought to the edge of the promised land and they weren't, who weren't able to enter in as uh, basically a, a warning to these Hebrew Christians who had embraced the Lord Jesus Christ uh, not to fall short like they fell short by not trusting in the Lord Jesus and continuing to move forward. The reason why these people weren't able to enter into the promised land is because they did not believe the promise God had given that he was going to bring them into the land. They thought it was a fool's errand, that they were going to be destroyed. And for that reason, they weren't able to enter, and they actually all died in the wilderness. Okay? So he's using that as a warning, not to fall short like they did, but to trust the Lord. Now, he does say a couple of other things. The people of God eventually did enter into the land. Uh, and when they were in the land, David wrote a psalm, and he's going to quote that psalm in the passage that we're reading. And that psalm is basically warning them not to fall short of entering into the rest of God like those in the wilderness did. Now, the thing is, when David wrote that, he was in the land, the land they weren't able to enter because they didn't believe. That land was really just a picture of the heavenly rest. It wasn't the true rest of God. That's why David in the land could say, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts, but believe and enter that rest. It's those who believe who enter into that rest. So the idea is that there is still a rest, and that rest is essentially heaven. And the way we enter into it, the way the Hebrews enter into it, is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's because the possibility of entering into that rest through Jesus, because that still is there, because it's still available, there is still the keeping of the Sabbath day because the Sabbath is really a picture of the rest of God, of heaven that we're striving to enter into through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, hopefully that'll make sense as I read this passage. So let's read the first 11 verses of Hebrews 4. So the author to the Hebrews writes, Therefore, let us fear, if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it, for indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, and they being the Jews in the wilderness. But the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just uh, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest." although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them, that is the Jews, failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, and, and understand Joshua was the one who, who brought the second generation of Jews into the promised land. He brought them into that picture of rest. If Joshua had given them rest, that is the true rest, he, that is God through David, would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And that word Sabbath rest there means a Sabbath day. For the one who has entered his rest, I believe this is talking about Jesus, has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. 
Now, that's really all I can say about this passage, but just simply to say there remains a Sabbath keeping based upon the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. The uh, land of Palestine was merely a picture, not the reality. Even those who had the picture didn't have the reality. We enter into that reality through Jesus by trusting in Him and by following Him. So He's the one who gives us the true rest, and the fact that we may still enter into that rest that He has provided is the reason why this picture of that rest remains for us today. But we're going to see more about that as we work our way through this. Now, so far we've seen in this somewhat many series that the reason why God made us, our main purpose in life, is to glorify Him and enjoy Him. And of course, we enjoy Him by glorifying Him. You know, God doesn't need our service. He doesn't need for us to do the things that He calls us to do. The reason why He tells us to do them is because they're right, but also because we benefit when we do them. We enjoy Him when we glorify Him. Now, that's our main purpose, but this does not happen automatically. It's something we have to work at, something we have to put a great deal of effort in. Now, Jesus has made it possible. He's given what we need to start. Through his life and his death, he has given us the Holy Spirit, who not only gives us the ability to trust in the Lord Jesus but, and to be saved, but also to follow him. And he does that by changing our hearts to make us love him. Now, Jesus has given us his Holy Spirit, but he has also given us his word. God doesn't just say, love me and then leave it up to us to determine how to do that. He shows us in his word how he wants us to love him. That's exactly what the Ten Commandments are all about. Remember, Paul says, love is the fulfillment of the law. So he gives us his word to show us how. Now it's, it's up to us, you see. Having his spirit, having his word to aim our lives at the glory of God by growing in that love that he has given to us, and that's really what we're focusing on today and what we have been focusing on by reading and studying His Word so that we know His will, and by actually living that way with the single goal of pleasing Him. Now, last week, we saw one thing. There's one thing in particular that the Lord tells us, glorifies Him more than just about anything else, that makes Him rejoice, that makes all of heaven rejoice, and that is when one of His lost sheep is, is found, the importance of evangelism. Jesus says in Luke 15, verse 7, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, if this is what makes heaven rejoice the most, this is really what we ought to be focusing on. We need to be focusing on telling others about Christ. But in order to find these lost sheep, of course, we need to look for them. And we look for them, Jesus tells us, by shining his light, uh, by becoming more like him. Jesus says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So by reflecting his character in our lives. That's one way. The other way is by telling others about the gospel. The word of God is likened in scripture to a light that shines and, and shows us the way. Well, we're the only ones who have the light, and we need to shine the light so that others can find their way also uh, to the Lord. And then thirdly, we also need to believe, I should say secondly, we need to shine this light, but we also need to believe that there are yet those out there who belong to Jesus who need to be reached, who will see when we show them Jesus, who will hear when we tell them about Jesus. Jesus says in John 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now, if, if all that he was intending on saving had already been saved, we saw last week that Jesus would already have come. So the fact that he hasn't come means that there are those who are yet to be saved. Now, we ended last week by considering that one way we can receive power to do what the Lord calls us to do, to shine with his character, to communicate his message, and to believe that he will use us to bring the lost to faith in Christ, is to pray for more of his Holy Spirit. We saw in our text last week that the Lord sent his Spirit at Pentecost. 
uh, to give his disciples the power and the boldness to preach Christ. And we saw the transformation that made in their lives. But that same spirit was given to us when, uh, well, actually, when the Lord had mercy on us so that we could trust in him and so we could follow him. But we also saw through the example of the apostles that we need still to pray for continued help by the Holy Spirit. The disciples already had his Holy Spirit uh, when, um, but I should say when they were arrested and they saw what they were up against when the Sanhedrin threatened and warned them no longer to preach in the name of Jesus, they prayed, they prayed again. They prayed for God's help. And we read the ground shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So even though they had the Spirit of God, even though they had been filled on the day of Pentecost, they still needed fresh fillings, as it were, uh, of his power, which is what we need. This is really what made all the difference in their lives between living as nominal Christians or living as vibrant, powerful believers who are witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what made the difference in Paul's life. This made the difference in Whitfield's life, in Edward's life, in Spurgeon's life, as well as the lives of many others the Lord has used, and he is the one, the Spirit is the one who will make the difference in our lives as well. Now today, we're going to look further at how we can have more of the Spirit's presence, of his influence in our lives, and that way is communion with God. You know, that's what we talk about by the means of grace. You know, we talk about the different ways in which we can get the help of the Holy Spirit. These are the different ways that we actually have communion with God. Now, that communion with God takes place primarily, but not exclusively, on the Lord's Day by keeping the Sabbath holy, by setting the first day of the week aside to spend with God. That's the reason why he gave us this day is so that we might have communion with him. And I think sometimes if we don't understand that, we see it as, as the big downer rather than the big blessing which the Lord intends for it to be. It should never be a downer for us that we are called to spend the day with God. Now, what I want us to do is this morning consider that the day that the Lord gave from the creation, he still gives to us today. And this evening, I want us to consider why we need this commandment uh, if we are to be spiritually strong. We need this commandment. We need to observe this commandment. Now, I don't think I need to tell you that the Sabbath is controversial, right? I think many, if not most churches, don't believe that this commandment is actually in force. If we look around, we see that even among the churches that do believe it, there's, there's very few people that seem to believe that this commandment has any relevance to us today. And we need to ask the question, why? Why is that the case? Well, it's mainly because of two statements that the Apostle Paul makes. One of them is in Colossians 2, verses 16 and 17. And the other one is in Romans 14, 5. Let me read the, the one from Colossians. Paul writes this. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. I should pause right there and just note that the word Sabbath day in the original Greek is not the Sabbath day, but it simply is the plural, Sabbaths, and that's very important when we come back to this. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay, that's one statement. The second one is in Romans 14, verse 5. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. Well, so basically they're thinking, well, you can keep it if you want to or not keep it if you want to. Everyone should be fully convinced. Now, the argument goes this way. That since Jesus in his life kept the law of God perfectly we no longer need to keep it because Jesus kept it for us. Now, some apply this to all 10 of the commandments. Jesus kept them. We don't have to keep them. We call that particular view antinomianism, which means basically against the law. They think that's legalism, and to keep the law in any sense is always going to be legalism. And if we try to keep the law, then we're fallen from grace, and we can't be saved. 
you know, think about what Paul said to the Galatians. But others apply it only to the Sabbath for some reason. Now, they believe, again, Jesus finished his work. We just read in Hebrews chapter 4, he entered into his rest. But now, when we rest, we just simply rest by trusting in Jesus. We rest in him. That's the way it's usually put. Now, it isn't really clear why they single out that particular commandment to apply in this way, because remember, Jesus kept all the other commandments, didn't he? I mean, he kept the first commandment. He didn't have any other God before the true God. He worshiped and loved his Father more than anything else. But the fact that he did that, they wouldn't say, it doesn't matter now whether we worship the true God or false gods, because Jesus worshiped the true God, so he's done it for us. And Jesus kept the second commandment. You know, he didn't worship the true God through images, did he? But they wouldn't say it's okay now for us to worship through images because Jesus did it right. We can now do it wrong. Well, the same thing is true of the third commandment all the way through the, the tenth commandment. Why would his fulfilling the fourth commandment make it no longer apply to us? Well, the fact is, it wouldn't, you see. Remember, we don't keep the law of God in order to earn our salvation. If we do that, we are legalists and we are under the condemnation that, that Paul speaks of to the Galatians. But if we keep it out of love for the Lord, because we love Jesus, because we want to follow his example, because he's the one who tells us to, to do this, that's what we call that evangelical obedience. Uh, we're just being faithful children. We're already children and so we obey the Father. The difference between that and legalism is, if I'm good enough, God will accept me. There's a big difference between those two things. God has saved us. Now we live as obedient children. So the question arises then, what is Paul actually saying then in these two passages if he is not telling us it's okay not to keep all the commandments or not to keep at least one of the ten? Well, he's actually telling the Jews something that we saw recently that when it comes to the Jewish traditions, the food and the drink, the festivals, the new moons, the Sabbaths, the ceremonial Sabbaths, they had freedom in Christ, liberty to keep them or not to keep them, as long as they didn't keep them for the purpose of making God accept them. If they did that, they would be turning it into a work. Now remember, what Paul tells us, what we see in his example, circumcision. They could be circumcised if they wanted to be. I mean, that, that Paul did that to Timothy so that he wouldn't offend the Jews as they went around evangelizing. And no one had the right to judge them. But if somebody received circumcision because he was thinking that by doing that, God's going to accept him, then he falls under the curse of the law and under legalism. There's a big difference. Are you doing this to be saved? Or in this case, are you doing it because you don't want to offend somebody else because it's one of the traditions that you have the freedom to do or not to do? Now, the same thing is true in every area of Christian liberty. Remember, we, can, we have freedom to do certain things or not do certain things. But we are reminded that we should never use our freedom in the Lord either to keep an unbeliever from coming to Jesus or stumbling a weaker brother. As long as we're careful with our freedom, we can use it as long as we don't do those two things. Now, in these passages, Paul is simply saying that the Jewish Christians were allowed either to keep or not keep the Jewish ceremonial Sabbaths, of which there were several, which is why the word is in the plural in the original. Here's where you have to watch out for the theological bias of the translators. They thought this is referring to the moral commandment, the Sabbath, so they translated that, the Sabbath, but it actually is indefinite. It's not the, it is, it's Sabbaths, and it's referring to the ceremonial Sabbaths, the Sabbaths that were connected to the ceremonial law. And he says, if somebody keeps that, if you want to keep that, that's fine. Let no one judge you if you do. You have the freedom to do that. So he's not saying that we shouldn't keep the fourth commandment, uh, the, the, the Sabbath that God has made a moral requirement for us. We still need it. Now, let me just um, move to the second part and give to you a, a series of positive arguments of why we believe that that's what the Bible actually teaches. Because our conscience, as Luther put it, needs to be bound 
by the Word of God if we're going to do what the Lord tells us to do. I mean, if we're not convinced God says it, we're not going to do it, right? We need to hear what the Lord has to say before we come to any conclusions, okay? So here's a few things to think about. We do understand, first of all, that the Lord established the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, right? The seventh day of the creation week. We read in Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Moses writes this. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. Now, Moses tells us he blessed that day because on this day he rested, but he blessed it because he intended it to be a blessing for the man and the woman that he had made, as well as for their children who would follow. This was a day given to Adam and Eve to rest. You know, God made them to work. Remember, he says, I want you to cultivate the garden. I want you to guard the garden. That's your work. But on the seventh day, don't cultivate the garden. I want you to rest on that day. And we're going to see this evening a little bit more carefully. I want you to rest on this day because I want you to spend this day with me. God came down and walked with him, didn't he? Okay. So he meant it as a blessing. Now, later we see in Scripture that when the Jews went down into Egypt because of the famine, remember Joseph went down ahead of time, and then after Joseph died, another Pharaoh rose up who didn't know Joseph. He made all the Israelites slaves. And during that time, they lost the Sabbath. They could no longer rest on that seventh day. So when the Lord brought them out of Egypt, the first thing he did for them was to provide them with manna. Remember, manna is the bread from heaven, the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the second thing he did was he restored their Sabbath, the picture of the rest that the bread of heaven actually gives us. If we will eat him, as it were, by faith, that is, receive him by faith, not literally eat him. But Jesus said, I'm the true bread that comes down out of heaven. He who eats of me will have eternal life. They had the manna. They had the day of rest. Eat the manna. Enter into the rest. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will enter into rest. Okay. Now, it's interesting that when the Lord gave them the Sabbath, he also had made it so that the manna, remember, they, they had to go out every day and gather manna, and they could only gather enough for one day. It didn't matter how much they gathered. If they gathered little, they had enough. If they gathered too much, they didn't have too much. It just seemed somehow to, uh, well, miraculously equal out. But if they kept any till the next day, then it would spoil. But not on the sixth day. The Lord made it last over the seventh day so that they could rest on the seventh day. He says in Exodus 16, verses 29 through 30, Moses writes this, See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. And then we see when he finally brings the children of Israel to Mount Sinai, he includes the Sabbath in the Decalogue or in the Ten Commandments. Now, no one really questions any of that. Anybody who believes the Bible has to agree that that's exactly what God did. The real question is whether or not the Sabbath continues now that Jesus has completed his work. Now, why should we believe that it, that it does? Well, first of all, because the Lord said in the Old Covenant that when the New Covenant came, the Sabbath would not only continue, but everyone who keeps it would actually be blessed. He says through Isaiah to um, the eunuchs and the foreigners, okay, he's, he's singling them out because in the Old Covenant, they were excluded from God's covenant. You know, if, if, if you were in one of the other categories, you could not enter into the assembly of the Lord. So the Lord in this passage is looking beyond that time to the time of the new covenant when these are actually brought in, right? I mean, think about Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Think about, um, uh, well, uh, I think primarily uh, Peter when he's preaching to the Gentiles, though they were god fearers. He's bringing in foreigners. He's bringing in eunuchs. This is talking about the new covenant. But in the context of that, he's also referring to the keeping of the Sabbath. In Isaiah 56, verses 4 through 7, For thus says the Lord, 
to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant. To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Also the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Remember that house that Jesus said would be a, a house of prayer for all the nations. So the Lord is bringing these people in when before they were excluded, he's talking about new covenant times but he says in this context they will be keeping the Sabbath. Second, the Lord tells us the Sabbath would be celebrated on the very day that his son would rise from the dead. Psalm 118, verses 22 through 24. And think about this in the context of uh, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. The stone which the builders rejected, that is Jesus Christ, has become the chief cornerstone, and that happened at his resurrection. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And now notice, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now, we do see uh, in the New Testament as we read through that the disciples, as they embrace the Lord Jesus Christ, they may have gone to the, to the synagogue earlier on in order to evangelize, but they met together on the first day of the week, the day that our Lord Jesus rose from the dead. Paul on that day gathered people together and he preached until midnight. Remember Eutychus fell out of the window and he, he was killed, but then he was brought back to life through a, through a miracle. Uh, they, uh, Paul directed the Corinthians that when they meet together on the first day of the week that they should take up that offering for the poor saints in Jerusalem. Uh, the early Christians met on the first day of the week. They were celebrating the, basically the Lord's resurrection. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Remember, the author to the Hebrews tells us that that Sabbath remains because of the work of Christ. Third, in the New Testament, we don't see Jesus as he is declaring himself to be the Lord. Think about the Sermon on the Mount. And he's correcting the Pharisees. And he's lifting the law of God back up to where it was. He is declaring himself to be the teacher of Israel. And he's giving New Testament, New Covenant teaching well, what does Jesus have to teach about the Sabbath? I want you to notice that never does Jesus tell us, you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. That was old covenant. I'm fulfilling that. You don't have to keep that. But rather, what he said is, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And then he taught them how to keep it because the Pharisees had messed it all up the way they had messed up everything else. They had made it too strict in certain places and too lenient in other places. And Jesus put it right back to where the Lord wanted to be. He says in Matthew 12, verse 8, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Now, fourth, when Jesus was warning his disciples about what was coming in 70 AD, which was God's judgment against Jerusalem for their execution of Jesus Christ, he told them to pray that they wouldn't have to flee Jerusalem on the Sabbath. He says in, in Matthew 24, verse 20, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. Okay, now... 70 AD, Jesus, when was Jesus crucified? When, when did he enter into his rest? When was his work complete? 30 AD, 70 AD, he says, when that day comes, pray that you don't have to run out of Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Well, if, if the Sabbath had been fulfilled in Christ and nobody was observing it anymore, what difference would it make, right? Jesus was saying the Sabbath would still be in force after his work was complete. Fifth, the author to the Hebrews tells us that the Sabbath day continues again because of the possibility of entry, excuse me, entering into God's rest or entering into heaven because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. I'll just simply read the text again, Hebrews 4, verses 9 through 10. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, and that word there, as I mentioned before, is, is only used once in the New Testament, and um, it, it, when it's studied in other contexts of literature, it refers to the keeping, uh, the, what Plutarch's Moralia used it in this way, it referred to the Jews' superstitious keeping of a day of rest. That's the way Plutarch used that word. That's the only other example we have of it besides what we have here in Scripture. There remains, therefore, a Sabbath rest, a Sabbath day, 
Uh, the Sabbath remains for the people of God because the one who has entered his rest, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, who did that on the first day of the week, rested from his works as God did from his. You know, God created the old creation. It was destroyed by sin. Jesus comes into the world. He does the work of the new creation. And now there is a new day commemorating the new creation. And that is the day Jesus entered into his rest, which is the first day of the week, the day which was to be a day of rejoicing for the church of God. Now the author to the Hebrews further tells us that in the new covenant that God gives us the desire to keep the Sabbath. Remember, he writes the law on our hearts. And that law in the context is the commandments that were written on stone, the Ten Commandments. We read in Hebrews 8, verse 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, honestly, I think any one of these arguments, examples, is enough really to make the case that the Lord continues to give us the Sabbath today. Now, this evening, we're going to look at why the Lord has given us the Sabbath and why it's still important that we keep the Sabbath. But what I want us to understand here is that it does continue. Like I said, this is a huge subject. We're not going to exhaust it in two sermons, but I just want to just look at these two things. But... As we close, let's just make one applicational point. Now, let's use what we've just seen about the Sabbath to examine our hearts. Okay? The question is, what do we think about all this? You know, what do we think about the Sabbath? What do we think about a day like this? Do we find the idea of spending? And when we're talking about the Sabbath. We're not talking about the worship service in the morning, the worship service in the evening. We're talking about the whole day, okay, 24 hours, okay. Do we find that appealing to spend that much time with God? Is that, is that something that we, we like? Or would we rather that God had really not said this, you know, that he just kind of left us to do whatever we want to do on this day? Well, we have to ask ourselves this question. If we don't find spending a day with God to be appealing, then how do we find the prospect of spending eternity with him, right? Because, I mean, every day we're going to be spending with the Lord throughout eternity, right? How do we, so what are we thinking about this? When, when, you know, what we think about the Sabbath really says quite a bit about the condition of our hearts, it tells us what we really, really love. Now, it, it is one thing, remember, to believe that this day doesn't continue. That, that's, that's a different issue. I think we all need to examine the evidence, and then we need to come to an informed conclusion. Does God say there is such a day or, or not? But it's another thing not to want a day like this. Because really, if we looked at things the way we should, if we were experiencing God the way He wants us to experience Him, our attitude should not be, I don't want a day like this, but I want every day to be like this. I want to spend every day, all day with the Lord. And there is a sense in which we do that. We are to walk with the Lord all day, every day. But not like on the Sabbath, where we set aside all of our work and everything else that would distract us and we spend the day with Him. I think we'd all admit when we love someone, we want to spend time with them. And if we love the Lord most of all, as we're commanded in Scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, if that's the way we love him, then we're going to want to spend as much time with the Lord as we possibly can. And that's really what the Sabbath is, is all about. So let's examine our hearts on that particular point, and especially as we come to the table, because here we're going to be confessing our, our love for the Lord, that we love him most of all. Um, we really do need to mean that. When, before we uh, come to the table and participate in this, we can only mean that by the grace of God. He's the only one who can give us that love. If we are the Lord's, we do have that love, but remember, we still have that corruption we have to fight against. We still have to put that sin to death, and we need to grow in that love. But where we need to be is loving Him most of all so that this day actually is something we want, 
rather than something we see as getting in the way of something we want more than we want God. So why don't we use that to examine our hearts? Because I think that's really a sort of a global principle, isn't it? It kind of tells us uh, across the board where our hearts are at. But let's think about that as we prepare to come to the table. Uh, let, let's spend just a few moments, shall we, in silent prayer.